Valley Politics is sponsored by National Women's Political Caucus of Silicon Valley. Welcome to Valley Politics. I'm Terry Christensen, your host for this new show on politics and public policy in Silicon Valley and the South Bay. Dave Cortez is our guest today. He's just become president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors after narrowly losing the race for mayor of San Jose in November. How did that happen? Well, we'll find out and we'll also learn about his goals for the coming year as president of the Board of Supervisors. We'll also have an update on what's going on in San Jose's Council District 2, that's the Edenvale area, from Councilman Ash Kalra. Later, we'll visit with Susie Wilson, who served on the San Jose City Council and the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors from 1973 to 1990. That's on our Where Are They Now feature. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Dave Cortezzi, Supervisor for District 3. That's the Northeast County. And now Dave's President of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Dave, before we get to county business, let's talk a little bit about your run for mayor. You came incredibly close. Um, what do you think you could have done to get the, those few extra votes you needed to win? Ironically, it might have been less about what more we could have done and, and a lot more about turnout. You know, And I know yeah. uh, in some of the um, analyst work that you did during the course of the election, I think you were spot on saying you know, it really depends on, on how the Northeast area where I actually run the strongest, um, you know, how that pans out in the election and what kind of turnout we get. So you have to know in these elections where you're, where you're a little more powerless and, and where you can get things done and, and unfortunately, you know, when it comes down to two or three votes per precinct, it's, it's pretty hard to second guess yourself. But uh, we had a powerful campaign and we did the best we could. Do you think there was any backlash to the Police Officers Association uh, mailings that sort of were fear mongering around crime issues? Well, you know, when I have you know, control of the campaign 100%, when there's not so many they were independent, independent ex expenditures, right? Yeah, when, and when, I, when there aren't so many independent expenditures, you know, I'm, I'm undefeated in November races um, mm -hmm. when I control things like that because we really tend to run very, very positive campaigns. I'm always worried about backlash like that. But like I said, when with such a, a razor thin margin, it's, 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 you know, it's hard to actually figure out what happened. Um, you just kind of have to accept it and, and move on and uh, everything happens for a reason. I'm in a good spot now. Good. Fair enough. Well, let's let's move on to your new job. Um, tell us first how you get to be president of the Board of Supervisors and what, what it means to be president. Well, obviously you have to be elected uh, by the people. There's five of us representing 1.8 million people. As you said, I represent District 3, uh, 375,000 population, something like that. But once you get there, uh, we don't have a mayor. So the, the board itself each year votes and elects um, by at least a, a three-person a three uh, majority uh, the president of the board each year. It's usually a unanimous vote. There's usually, it's usually not contentious. Uh, it can be. Um, I didn't uh, have anything like that surrounding me this year. They, they voted me right in. Um, a little bit of it is, tends to be based on seniority and rotation if everything's going well mm -hmm. and people are, you know, are, are, are getting along well enough together. And this is a very uh, good board in that respect. A lot of experience. I haven't added up all the years of experience between me and Ken Yeager and Cindy Chavez and Joe Sabini, who was a former state senator, yeah. is actually a second stint on the board. Uh, Mike Wasserman, who is a Los Gatos mayor and a longtime public official, so uh, pe things tend to go, uh, you know, pretty smoothly, even when we don't agree. And in this case, uh, I was elected uh, elected unanimously by them, which is sort of like being appointed. So, what's it mean? What 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 power? What 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 what's going to happen because you're president of the board? Well, you know, each there's a lot of deference to the president of the board, especially in the early part of the year, or the calendar year, to set the priorities uh, for the board. Um, and uh, not every president's priority ends up becoming, you know, a new law, a new ordinance, or a new policy or program. But a lot of them do. And again, there's there's some uh, deference. Um, the, the president of the board by and large controls appointments to committees, um, who serves on VTA, mm. who serves on some of the state regulatory bodies and so forth. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's some influence there that, that ends up, you know, sort of happening. 
Um, and you know, the other thing is, and the, probably the most important thing, and the, the people who serve in the local government know the importance of this, uh, maybe in state government as well, the president of the board controls the agenda. And a lot of people don't realize that in our system, anytime the president of the board wants to add something or delete something from the agenda, mm. uh, that'll happen. And, um, and sure, there's ways for the rest of the board to get things put back on the agenda. Uh, but you know, if, if I think something's not ready for prime time, and one of my colleagues is placed on the agenda, or, or even the county executive, you know, by the stroke of a pen, I can uh, sort of veto that and, and make it go away. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot of, of responsibility in, in having to do that. It would be like a rules committee in the city of San Jose mm -hmm. or in the state at the state level. But it's a one-person rules committee. It's a one-person rules committee. Nice, yeah. nice. Thank you. We're going to talk about your priorities as president of the board in just a second, but first we thought it might be useful to hear from some of the residents of the county about the services they think should be improved. So let's take a quick look at some of their answers. Good. If we could have more service, I would like to point to, there's a person behind us, he's homeless. So any service we can have to help the homeless or the needy, that would be great. I think that the homeless problem is probably one of the biggest problems here. I see a lot of people just wandering. They don't have a home. I see, you know, walking in the rain and they're just trying to find an awning to sleep under. And I think that if we could really help those people, it would make a big difference. Probably public transit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and why? Because, like, it takes a half an hour to get anywhere, <laughs> especially on the weekends. So it's not really practical. I think uh, what needs to be most improved is the help um, or location where homeless people could go and um, be and get their resources. A lot of them come onto campus or in the library are disruptive um, so I think that they need help. So Dave, homelessness seems to be on the minds of lots of your constituents. What's your reaction to their comments? Well, uh, it's affirming um, in a sense. I mean, we're, it's tragic that uh, homelessness is, is such a pervasive problem that everybody's thinking about it and worried about it and concerned about it. On the other hand, uh, the work that we're doing at the county now is, is really focused on the homeless population. In fact, in the State of the County speech uh, uh, just a couple of nights ago, um, I talked about how we will now be creating a new task force at the county um, that's going to operate very quickly. You know, in Super Bowl terms, you'd call it a hurry-up offense. Um, uh, Supervisor Chavez and, and Wasserman will be um, liaisons to that task force, but importantly, the, uh, the head of the South Bay Labor Council, Ben Field, mm -hmm. and the CEO and president of the Silicon Valley Chamber of Commerce, Matt Mayhood, uh, they will co-chair that task force, and there'll be stakeholders and, and people uh, representing um, nonprofit groups, but also uh, we expect to have people there representing the homeless population. What we want to do is start implementing some of the ideas that have been kicking around for the last couple of years and get them into play. Well, good. I think that'll please some of the people we heard comments from. What are some of your other top priorities as president of the board? Well, we're working uh, very hard on, on public health issues, which is you know a big uh, issue area for the county in, in general. Um, this year, uh, I announced that we're going to put on you know a full court press on type 2 diabetes, and it's not something that um, you know receives a lot of media attention mm -hmm. or maybe not the most glamorous thing in the world to talk about. Uh, we've been talking about Ebola and other things lately. The fact of the matter is, it, it's, uh, the experts, the, the doctors tell us that up to 200 million people uh, can be impacted by type 2 diabetes in the country, uh, 40 million currently. And you know it's something that, that is viewed as being at epidemic proportions right now. We believe um, as good as our county is, uh, even though it's big, 1.8 million people, that we can educate the population, uh, get people to do the blood tests um, and, and work that they need uh, to halt, really kind of extinguish diabetes before it becomes a problem for people. And we want to do that comprehensively throughout the county. Uh, that is uh, um, a, uh, an initiative that Supervisor Ken Yeager is going to lead. He, he just has a tremendous legacy here as a as a county supervisor and as a city councilman leading public health issues. Give us one more of your top goals. Um, you know, we are um, um, very, very much intrigued by what's going on up in Richmond, California, where they had a tremendous violent crime rate over the last few years. Uh, the city there, a small city, um, called on its county, Contra Costa County, to put together something called an Office of Neighborhood Safety. 
um, and that office um, uses mentoring, uses intervention uh, to, to try to prevent crime with young people, but also with those who might be um, at risk of reoffending, adults who might reoffend, um, to use mentoring um, and, and even stipends in some case uh, to get them uh, to turn their lives around, and it's working. It's working. They just went through a long period with virtually no violent crime since they started that office. So we will be doing that in Santa Clara County as well, and we hope it's something that we can partner with our our cities on, especially uh, our biggest city, the city of San Jose. And I think um, I think they're ready to to partner with us in a number of areas. That all sounds good. You set several other laudable goals during your state of the county speech. But I'm wondering, what's the state of county finance? Um, is, are, are we on solid ground financially? Are public employee pensions funded sufficiently? Yeah, great question. Um, I touched on it a little bit at the state of the county, but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, we have stabilized the budget in Santa Clara County, thanks in part to the 15,000 county employees who, starting in 2011, um, agreed to $225 million in wage and benefit cuts. Um, they did that over three years. We've got that behind us now. The budget is stabilized. Uh, we're looking at uh, a small surplus projection this year. That doesn't mean we want to go out and spend money wildly. Some of the programs I'm talking about, like the diabetes program, can mm -hmm. be done with existing resources. Um, and that's the name of the game, um, you know, especially for this board. We're looking for um, benefits that exceed costs uh, at all times. Um, so I think we can do that. And pu the public employee pensions at the county, um, there, there are two areas, of course, um, in cities and counties that you have to deal with. One is retiree health care and one is retirement pensions. Uh, our pensions are part of the CalPERS system, which is the case with most counties and cities. Um, we are paying in, we're paying in timely uh, to CalPERS, and we're right up to date. We just received a report that says if we just keep making our payments, we're fine over the next 25 to 30 years. Retiree health care was a little bit more of a problem because before I got on this board, this county, like many cities uh, and other counties, got behind on their payments um, toward retiree health care. They weren't setting the money aside to take care of the people who are going to retire 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And that creates what everyone calls an unfunded liability. Um, we had one of those. Uh, thanks to the leadership of one of my colleagues, uh, Joe Samidian, uh, we really attacked that problem aggressively about a year and a half ago and set, up, set in motion a, a payment plan to catch up, um, much like somebody would if they were behind on their mortgage. Uh, and it's tens of millions of dollars every year, but we're putting that aside. It takes discipline. The employees agree that it needs to be done. And I think we're in, in fine shape in that regard now. You've been very generous to all of your colleagues in your comments today. Do you all really get along as well as it sounds? Well, most of the time. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean we agree. There's a lot of three to two votes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times uh, three to two, four to one exists. I think that's healthy. I just think that this board has, at, at the risk of sounding self-serving, has, has a degree of professionalism that's come from you know, the school of hard knocks, you know, over mm -hmm. the years you start to realize that uh, you have to work as a team, uh, you have to work on the next problem uh, immediately after you disagree on the last problem. Uh, it doesn't do any good to walk around and, and carry resentment around or, or anything that resembles that in politics. It's really important for people to try to work together, uh, say, you know, I respectfully disagree with you. Um, now let's move on. And, and that's how this board is. And it makes it a little bit easier, I think, uh, for each of us to acknowledge uh, the good parts of each other. Well, Dave Cortese, thanks for being part of Valley Politics today. Good luck with your year as president of the board. I hope you achieve all those goals. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be on the show. Now let's hear from Ash Cholera about what's going on in his city council district. Hello, I'm Ash Kalra, and I have the great honor of representing District 2 in the City of San Jose. District 2 is the southernmost district in San Jose and has a landscape that varies from the farmlands of Coyote Valley to companies working on cutting-edge products and ideas in the Edenville Technology Park. Technology Park is really starting to boom coming out of the recession and boasts many dozens of companies whose employees enjoy a reverse commute to work in an environment surrounded by rolling hills and wonderful trails. Our history includes the West Coast headquarters of IBM, the location where the disk drive was invented. Now, the same location still has driving industry jobs with Western Digital and Equinix. And 
to the excitement of South San Jose residents, there's a new shopping center that has recently opened that includes over 600,000 square feet of stores and restaurants. Plus, before the end of 2015, expect a new Costco built right next to our shiny new South San Jose police substation. And before we get too carried away with all of the wonderful new amenities being built, let's not forget the gem of Edenville, the historic Hayes Mansion. Built in 1905, the Hayes Mansion was the private home of the Hayes family until the 1950s. After falling into disrepair, the city of San Jose purchased the property and renovated it, opening it to the public as a hotel and conference center in 1994. It is a beautiful mansion that is available for corporate events, weddings, and other private parties. Plus, the Sunday brunch is certainly one of the best in Silicon Valley. Finally, you cannot talk about South San Jose without referring to the wonderful neighborhoods we call home. From the homes nestled against the San Teresa foothills to the nine mobile home parks that offer affordable living for so many seniors and families. There are plenty of options and lifestyles accommodated by the variety of neighborhoods that make up our community. District 2 certainly highlights some of the best of San Jose. Please contact my office to learn more about District 2 or if you'd like to meet up with me. Have a wonderful 2015. Now it's time for Where Are They Now? Today our guest is Susie Wilson, who served as San Jose City Council member from 1973 to 1978 and represented the South County on the Board of Supervisors from 1979 to 1990. Susie had so much to say, we're going to broadcast her, our interview with her in two parts. Here's part one. Susie Wilson, thanks for having us in your home. We're eager to talk to you about your 18 years in, in public office. But first, tell us what you're doing now. Well, what I'm doing now, besides taking care of my husband, who is not very well, I still get very involved in public policy. And when I get mad, I get <laughs> even. Uh, get I, uh, My first best accomplishment, I think, in my retirement is I for the first time ran a campaign and won against all odds about the water district policies. Ah, uh -huh. and I, not an election campaign. Yes. Oh, it was an election campaign. An election okay. about what the water district yeah. was doing. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the person that needed to be unseated was an uh, entrenched incumbent. And so we unseated him with an excellent woman candidate. So you're still involved in some campaigns and elections and public yes. policy issues. Yes. Are there things you miss about being in elected office, being a county supervisor, being a city council member, having all that power? Well, the power I understood, which some women at that time did not, <laughs> and I tried to teach women about power. One of the things I always tell candidates who come and visit with me, that you have to use the power for what you feel passionate about. And that power, though, stays with the seat. And any power that you have when you leave is whether you've done a good job or not. And then you can still have power to do the things you want to do as a non-elected official. So you feel you've had some power without being in office? Oh, yes, I have. Yes? Yes. To help elect other women to on elect public policy issues? And, and judges. I've, I have helped to elect Paul Colin recently in the last couple of years. And judges. I know a lot of judges and they, uh, uh, candidates come to me and I helped unseat a woman candidate, a woman judge, in fact, last time because I felt she was not doing the job. When you help a candidate, what does that mean? What do you actually do? What I actually do is, is to talk about the nuts and bolts of what you have to do as a, in a campaigner. I talk about, as I did with Nye, who was my candidate for the Water District, the first thing you've got to do is go out and raise money. <laughs> and then three weeks later she came back and she'd raised uh, $10,000. And I said, then you've got to go walk precincts. You've got to do the nuts and bolts things, and you've got to meet people. You should have a list of about 20 people you need to meet, and, at the, and that list never decreases. It keeps being 20 people that you have to meet with. But on election day, you throw the list away because you don't have to meet another person. <laughs> but in the, what I loved about the office is you meet wonderful people. You meet people that have problems, and you try to solve them. You have employees that work so hard for the county, for the city. You have great employees of your own. I guess Bob Brownstein and I 
became, uh, we were twins. He was your staff member. He was my yeah. chief of staff for the entire time. In fact, he helped me get elected. He quit his job to run my campaign. I didn't know that he was uh, living on his savings mm -hmm. because it didn't pay him much and he wouldn't accept any money because we need the money for the campaign. So uh, I try to tell people the, the practical kind of things that you have to do and you have to know what you want to do. Let's go back to your first campaign. Yes. For city council, 1973. Yes. What gave you the idea and confidence to run? Did you know all the things you've just been talking to us about then? I have all kinds of good instincts, but the reason I ran was that I was very involved in the 60s with the YWCA and still am. I probably, I've volunteered for 52 years for the YWCA and been, was the president in the 60s. And we had, and we still have, uh, but we had an imperative uh, to eliminate racism wherever it existed by any means necessary. And also it was racism and sexism. And I went to a conference on racism in Chicago, outside of Chicago, about on the Great Lakes. And there I saw these young women, I was about 44, 45, so these young women, 20 years younger than I was, and they were, they were daring to do things in college and in the press to, to about sexism and about how the way that society was treating them. And I looked at them just in amazement and thought, I never really have dared much in my life. Hmm. I've been having a good, happy life. And I got home on, on September the 29th. It was the day before my birthday, so I remember the date. The next day I got on the 29th, I got a telephone call from a woman who said she'd been given my name. She asked me the question, have you ever considered running for city council? And I said very honestly, no, I had not. I said I had a couple of men in the church who said I'd be good because I had such good common sense and I should run for the city council because they were dis displeased with it. So I listened to her and I said, let me think about it. So that night at dinner table, I said to my family, my three sons and, and my husband, we just sit around and talk, and I said, guess what happened to me today? <laughs> and I told him, and they said, well. Why don't you? Well, actually, Bill said, uh, well, I know you'll win. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence, of course. And they said, uh, whatever you want to do. You know, we'll support whatever you want to do. And I said, yes, I'd run. Just that simple. I knew what I wanted to do. So five years on the city council, what do you think was your greatest accomplishment during those five years? Uh, well, there were two of them that were great accomplishments for me. One was we'd started the Rape Crisis Center at the YWCA. And we wanted the police officers to carry a card that said that they could be met at the hospital with a person who would help them through this whole blasted process that mm -hmm. they had to go through. And every police department in the county were carrying those cards except the San Jose Police Department and, and uh, Jackie could not get a meeting with our chief of police. And I said, oh, that's simple. And I picked up the phone and I said to Chief Murphy, I have a person here, I, I, I'd like to have a meeting with you. He said, sure, who should I bring along? And I said, well, bring along the one who's responsible at De Anza for the scubaing. So he brought her. And there in a room, a young woman sat there and told how she'd been treated by the San Jose police. And guess what? Jackie became a part of that program. The San Jose Police Department was turned around. They became the best the way they treated women. It had been great. And the other thing is I, I helped make a decision for the San Jose police women to become police officers. And they did win a lawsuit because I explained to them that they could never get four votes. They only had three votes on the council. Mm -hmm. They never get the fourth vote. I knew the council. And uh, I couldn't tell them what to do. But I said, you know what, right now you're treated like and terrible. And if you sue, you'll be treated terrible. I said, but the difference is you'll have a police officer's pay. And it won't make any difference. Right, so that was really the breakthrough for women yes. on the San Jose Police Department. Yes, it was. What about your biggest disappointment? Or oh, that was Gay Pride Day. When uh, the, com the, the community of gays, lesbians, were having a Gay Pride Day at the park. And they asked for a resolution. And they got it. A council resolution. Council resolution. Yeah. And they all, they, all got, they all got resolutions. Anybody who walked in the door got a resolution. If they were an organized mm -hmm. community and the gay pride people were. 
And so we passed it unanimously. And there was a church in Los Gatos that came down and stormed the chambers, and there were the chambers were filled. 400 people came down the next week, and it was rescinded. The council debated and debated it, and uh, and that was the night that we we, we organized and we passed unanimously. Oh. And then Al Garza, a, a council member, uh, put it back on the agenda to rehear it in two weeks' time. So then we went out and had meetings, and I met with people who I said, I don't understand why you're so upset. <laughs> you're, you're talking about God who loves everybody, and you're here, you're, you, you preach such hate in this council chamber. I don't understand you. And I was a church member and a director of youth, and I just didn't understand where they were coming from. So uh, it got back on the council, and then it, it was rescinded on a five to two vote. Jim Self and I were the only ones who stood firm and it almost wrecked my career to run for the Board of Supervisors because the next month I was signing up to run. Right. I was going to be a shoe-in and then there were <laughs> 16 in the race because of what I had done. And that Los Gatos church population was in your district. Yes. Yes. Completely. Doors slammed in my face. Wow. And that was it. I barely made it into the runoff. And then the gods smiled on me again. and. Four members of the city council fired a very popular city manager, Ted Tedesco, and I was on the losing end of that race, uh, that, that vote. Mm -hmm. But that time, by, and that was in the runoff, and I knock on the door and people say, are you part of the fearsome foursome? The ones that fired the city manager. That's right. right. And I'd say, no ma'am, I wasn't. And <laughs> I stood firm, I wanted him to stay. And flipped the whole, one issue flipped me into being a, almost a loser, and then it flipped me into wow. being a winner. As you can see, Susie's a passionate leader with a lot to say, so we'll hear more from her on our show next month. And I hope you can also see that like Susie, you can make a difference in your community just by stepping forward and getting involved. Meanwhile, we hope you'll interact with us. We have a new Valley Politics Facebook page where you can post your comments about the show, and suggest guests or topics you'd like us to address. Tell us what you want to see. Or you can email us directly at valleypolitics at createtvsj.org. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics today. See you next time. Eli Thomas Menswear is a proud sponsor of Valley Politics, Italian contemporary clothing for today's executive lifestyle. Eli Thomas Menswear is located at 350 South Winchester Boulevard, next to Santana Row.